switch to another another couple of stories. Uh, we had uh, the other uh, the other part I mentioned, Jawbreaker. We had an opportunity where we got approached by Tiger uh, Electronic Toys, who wanted to get into the 2600 market. That was when everything was really big in 2600, and it was expanding tremendously just before the crash. Uh, and um, so they had literally reverse engineered the machine because you couldn't find out how these machines work. So they had to kind of take it apart and do various electronic and software probes to figure out how they how they worked. And and uh, so when we went out there to uh, to learn how to program 2600, they didn't even really know how some of these things work. They, they kind of, you'd hear things like, well, if you put this value into this, then that kind of seems to make this happen. And, and uh, so it was, it was a really unusual environment, but we got, um, we got a few programs done on, on the 2600, and then afterwards, online wanted to port uh, some changes had to be done in Jawbreaker because if anybody's played 2600 Pac-Man and saw that you know, terrible flicker because of the limitations of object drawing, we we kind of redesigned the game so that you could do a, a dot-eating pseudo-maze game that wasn't in a free format maze so that I could restrict uh, where the characters were moving and not have to draw so many characters on the line at the same time. Uh, and it, it turned out to be a, a, a unique uh, gameplay all on its own, and um, uh, Sierra Online wanted to translate that product back to the computers. And he, um, he hired somebody else to, to do that. I can kind of get into that a little bit, too, because that's its own sort of tale. But uh, it, it, it was really unique, because the other person who did the, the translation, he had never seen the 2600 version of the program. And apparently, Online didn't have any of these versions of the program. And so Ken Williams just kind of drew on a piece of paper. He drew a couple of lines down and a couple of circles. It looks like this. And so the guy goes back to do, anybody seen Jawbreaker 2 on either the Apple or Commodore or uh, Atari machines? OK, well, it has these really, really big happy faces. Because in effect, what happened is Ken Williams only drew five lines on the screen. And since the guy was literally copying this rough draft, that's all he put in the game. And so the, uh, the lines got really big, the characters got really big, he didn't draw the passages where they were supposed to be, and so they didn't wind up in the game, so all the passages were complete dead ends. And the game was essentially unplayable, because you'd go down and, and you'd have a dead end at the end of the passage, and then because there weren't enough passages to begin with, it was just... I mean, it was just funny that the game wound up being completely different than it was supposed to simply because of Ken drawing a rough draft and the guy literally copying that. Um, so uh, strange how things like that can happen and actually get all the way through the process to, to, uh, to shipping. But uh, anyhow, so the Sordid Tale. Um, there, there's been mentions, little bits and pieces of this. Uh, for a while, I was prevented from talking about it you know, for legal reasons and, and all that kind of stuff. But we had back in um, back in the days of Frogger, there was there started to be some roots between Sierra Online and, in particular, Ken Williams and myself. And uh, as I started to look for other opportunities, uh, Parker Brothers, who wanted to produce a cartridge for Atari Computers, approached online and um, and asked if they could have uh, literally my, my code to, to convert and put out on ROM cartridge. And so Ken asked me, you know, he kind of said, do, do you want to do this? And uh, they were going to be able to get uh, $200,000 for, um, for the code, of which he would give me 20% of that, and um, he also wanted me to do a new version of the product to uh, essentially compete with his own product coming out on ROM cartridge. So he wanted kind of an enhanced version. And so I thought about it a little bit, and I thought, well, 20% was my normal royalty arrangement at the time, but that was for a product that Sierra packaged, distributed, advertised, you know, marketed the whole bit. And here he was essentially just an agent, uh, and so I, I went back to him with an offer. I said, you know, look, I mean, you're not really doing any, any work for this. You didn't even contact Parker Brothers. This whole thing just kind of fell in your lap. So why don't I give you 20% and, um, you know, let's go ahead and do the deal. And that's you know, $40,000 for you, basically for free and, and not having to do any work. And I had to do some things to get the code up 
portable to, uh, to ROM format and such. And then I also told them I'd do you know, a, a, a look-alike of, um, or not a look-alike, but an improved version of, of my own game. And he, you know, he basically threw me out of his office and, and, and told me how, you know, how arrogant I was to think I was, I was worth that much. So I thought about it, and I, and, and I went back in with what I thought was a reasonable offer, and I said, okay, let's split 50-50. And I'll give you your enhanced version within a month, which is well before the ROM manufacturer leave time. So you can get, you know, a two, we were going to do two players simultaneous on screen at the same time and a couple of other uh, enhancements to the game. And I said, you'll have that. You can get that out for sale. You can have this on the market even before Parker's cartridge ships, and everybody should be happy. And his response to that was to. Uh, well, this is what he told me. Now, this is this is this is really really weird because I didn't even find out what really happened until literally a couple of years ago. Um, but he hired somebody else to program the enhanced version of Frogger. He took my program off the market and called all the distributors and said, "We have a new version of Frogger. Send back all your outdated versions for return." We'll credit you, replace them with, uh, with the new version of the software. Well, to me, that, uh, that translated at the time, royalties were uh, literally coming in at $40,000 a month um, to me. And I, I went from getting $40,000 one month to the very next month I got a bill for $20,000 in returns. And supposedly my program had been taken off the market and, and um, this other guy had, had programmed a, a, a replacement of it. And we kind of got into a, a fairly you know, long drawn out legal battle from there. But what I found out recently, and this is kind of scary that I was so removed from the industry that this, that, that this could even happen, but apparently that never happened. The replacement version of Frogger programmed by somebody else never actually existed. And in effect, he just kind of made up this story about the returns, uh, literally just kept on selling my program and just stopped paying me for it. Uh, and even through all the legal actions that we took and the supposed audits that we're running, I mean, I don't know how this never came up. Um, I don't know why, I mean, granted, I lived in a very, very small town. Uh, to give you an idea of where I lived, the population sign when I moved in said 76, 76 people. Uh, it's a little town called Nipponawasi that even the county doesn't know how to spell. You can literally find it spelled differently on, on different <laughs> county maps. I do not know how to spell it, and I've been there for almost 20 years. So it's, um, I, 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 uh, I didn't have a whole lot of connections to, to the industry, and I guess I never, for God knows what reason, I never even checked to see that this other version ever existed. I look back and kick myself at it now, but um, anyway, it apparently never did. Uh, he just stopped paying. Uh, the lawsuit wasn't settled until years later, and, and the, the, the piddly amount that I got wouldn't have been even as much as if I had just continued collecting my Frogger royalties. So it was, uh, the, the whole thing was, was really a shame, and that, Cause I know a lot of people have asked me, what have you been doing since Frogger? Uh, that has been a common question. I mean, it's neat that people still remember Frogger. Uh, it's neat that I still run into people, I used to play that. I mean, that is very, very cool. But usually the very next question is, what in the world have you been doing? Um, and, and the answer to that is basically that I, that, kind of an emotional guy, and that hit me really, really hard when we had all those problems, I mean, between the loss of the code and, and the, the lying and the cheating and the lawsuits and everything. Um, I had a hard time just fitting in with the way that the business structure had changed so much, and I tried to find my own path. I did character generators for a while, I did educational software for a while, um, just floated around for, I don't know, gosh, 10 almost 15 years before I finally decided that I uh, I just didn't feel like I belonged any place anymore. And so I got back into programming of, of all places, Atari Jaguar, uh, in that um, short-lived system. But uh, 
it, it was something that at least got me back back in. I realized that that this is this is where I belong. I'm currently trying to do uh, PDA and cell phone games. In fact, I'm trying to license um, Frogger. Uh, when I went back and did um, did Jaguar stuff, first thing they said is let's do Frogger, and I thought, okay, well. I just had a problem with being out of the industry for 10 or 15 years and coming back and just doing Frogger again. Uh, so I told them I would do that for my second program, but I wanted to do something else first. Um, something I told a couple of people, I, the, the game I planned to do was a pizza delivery driving game that I thought was going to be a lot of fun. I'd always wanted to do a free format city driving game with kind of a uh, a fun reason for why you would be wanting to drive from point A to point B really fast. And so you've got pizzas that are slowly cooling, and the faster you can get them to your customers, the the hotter the pizzas are, and the better your tips are. Effectively, I, I um, the game uh, that I wanted to do uh, is a lot like Crazy Taxi. So it was really cool to see Crazy Taxi come out, because, and I and I thoroughly enjoyed that game. So I thought this is exactly what I've been looking for: free form driving with a with a fun theme. Um, let's see a couple of other disjointed stories, and then I want to see if you have any any questions. Uh, the going back to my Atari 100 programming, people didn't tell you how Atari kept the secrets of programming their computers, just like the VCS. They kept the secrets of programming their computers completely secret as well. And somebody who, you, they, you read all the press releases and it says uh, MAO Machine does up to four colors and you load up one of Atari's games and you start counting and it doesn't take you very long before you get well above four and kind of figure something's wrong here. And they're telling me I can only get four and yet you can obviously see significantly more than that in some of their other games. So a combination of disassembling code and you know, poking things around and, and, uh, and such, started to find little bits and tidbits and pieces of, of the hidden Atari secrets. And a friend of mine that I was working with this on, he actually had a contact inside of Atari. And it was a, a younger, I think, it was, I think he was 18 or something like that, young, younger kid, a little bit mischievous. And so the guy that was, and everything's under non-disclosure, so you're not supposed to tell anybody about the secrets. So he's got him on the phone, and he says, look, we've been poking around in here, and we can kind of get stuff up on screen, but it's we haven't figured out why and how yet, and it's kind of intermittent. And it seems like you have to do certain things to turn these graphics on in the first place. And the guy's kind of given him yes and no answers and all. And, and uh, well, I really can't tell you what these locations are and, and, and those, those kind of responses. So finally, he says, well, he says, if I, if I guess the location, I mean, if I say that, you, can you tell me if that's right or not? And he says, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. So I'll, I'll give you three guesses. And if you can come up with it in, in three guesses, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. And so he said, um, is it one of the locations that we've already talked about? I said, oh, if I tell you that, then you only get two guesses. So it uh, and turned out we was talking about the DMA control lines and things to turn on the graphics, but it's just it, it's amazing how and and I I've, I've been in this situation too where you wind up with this knowledge that you're not supposed to tell anybody, but it's very cool knowledge and you want to tell everybody uh, and uh, it, in tip typical hacker fashion, knowledge is supposed to be free. I mean, knowledge is the kind of thing that people can use to make more cool stuff with, and there's no reason why that should be secret. So it was really interesting to have interactions like this with people that wanted to be able to tell stuff but don't want to break the legal documents, and um, again, to ultimately be able to come up with resolutions like that.